Okay, welcome back. We're going to be looking at some examples for evaluating limits at infinity. So we'll start with some basic ones. We have the limit as x approaches infinity of 12. And remember, we have a rule that says whenever we're taking a limit as x approaches infinity of a constant, it's always going to be equal to that constant. So in this case, there's no variables. We just have 12. So this is going to be equal to 12 pretty easy limit. So then let's look at the limit as x approaches infinity of x to the fourth. Remember that we said that the limit as x approaches infinity of x is equal to infinity because as we get larger and larger values of x, the output of our function is going to get larger and larger. So it's going to be approaching infinity. So in this case, if we were to plug in values of x into x to the fourth, x to the fourth is going to make that number bigger. No matter what positive number you plug in, as you get larger numbers of x, you're going to get a larger number in the output. So this is also going to approach infinity although it doesn't really exist. There is no set number that this limit equals, but rather as our values of x get larger, so does the output. So we would say that it approaches infinity. Next, we have the limit as x approaches infinity of five plus two over x. And this is going to use our special limit that the limit as x approaches infinity or negative infinity of one over x is equal to zero. It doesn't matter if you multiply it by any constant, right? This two isn't going to matter. We can multiply this by three x, four x, it would still be zero. And the power of x down here could also be larger. It could be x squared or x cubed and the limit as x approaches infinity would still be zero. So let's actually look at our limit here though and try to solve it. So we know that when we're taking a limit of two functions, so to say, that are added together, we can take the limit of each of them separately and add it together. So in this case, we'd have that this is equal to the limit as x approaches infinity of five, which is just going to be five, plus the limit as x approaches infinity of two over x, which we know is going to be zero. So we'll have five plus zero, and that's going to be equal to five. Next, we have the limit as x approaches negative infinity for 3x plus x over 4. Now, we could already reduce this or take the limit of this function and get 0. But because of this part right here, that's not going to be helpful because this x is in the numerator and not in the denominator. So our special limit doesn't apply here. So what we're going to have to do is combine these two fractions and get a function that hopefully we can take a limit of a little bit easier. So let's see what we can do. I'm going to get a common denominator, which means I'm going to be multiplying this by 4 over 4 and this by x over x so that we have an x down here and a 4 over here so that these two denominators are equal. So we're going to have that this is equal to the limit as x approaches negative infinity of three over x times four over four plus x over four times x over x. And that's going to be equal to the limit as x approaches negative infinity of 12 over four x plus x squared over four x. And that is going to be equal to the limit as x approaches negative infinity of 12 plus x squared over 4x. And all we did there was combine our numerator parts because their denominator is the same. So now, can we take a limit here? Well, if you watch the lesson, you'll know that we have some guidelines for what to do when we have limits at infinity of rational functions. Remember we said that if the highest degree of the x in the numerator is larger than the denominator, then our limit here is not going to exist if we use our method of multiplying by a form of one. And so we know that this limit will not exist because the highest degree in the numerator is higher than in the denominator, right? We had two up here and one down here. And so what we're gonna have to do in this case is plug in numbers that are getting increasingly smaller and smaller into our function to see where it's headed. So we'll start by plugging in negative one. So when x is negative one, and I'm gonna use a calculator for this, we'll get negative 3.25. Then we're gonna plug in negative 10. That's going to get us negative 2.8. Then if we plug in negative 100, we're going to get negative 25.03. Now, normally I would stop after three numbers, but I do notice that we went from this negative 3.25 and we got larger to a negative 2.8, but then we got really small at negative 25. So I'm gonna put another one and see if we get smaller again. So we'll put in negative 1000 
and I'll find that it's a negative 250. So now I'm kind of sure that this is getting smaller and smaller as we plug in smaller values of x. Sometimes this will happen. You'll see that it'll like do a little jump and then it will really decrease. Sometimes you'll have a function like this one where if you were to graph it, you would see that it would look a little bit like this where it starts to increase, but then it gets smaller and smaller. So it's kind of one of those deals where you just have to keep plugging in numbers until you get past this little bump and then you see what happens as your values get smaller and smaller. So that kind of explains what's going on here, and that's why I plugged in an extra number to make sure I know where it's going. Okay, so then in this case, I see that it is approaching negative infinity because as we plug in smaller numbers, we are getting smaller outputs. So I'll say that this is equal to negative infinity, or at least that's what it's approaching. So for our next example, we're gonna look at the limit as x approaches infinity of 3x squared plus seven divided by 6x squared plus one. And in this case, we could see that our highest degree of x in the numerator and denominator is equal. And so by one of our guidelines, we could just say that this is going to be equal by the leading coefficients divided by each other or their ratio. So three divided by six, which would be one half. But I still wanna show you the actual method of how we get that answer because sometimes you gotta have to show your work. So I'm gonna go through it because it's actually helpful to see where the answer comes from anyway, even though we learned that guideline. So I'm gonna multiply by the highest power that I see either in the numerator and the denominator so in this case, it is x squared. So I'll multiply by a form of one of one over x squared divided by one over x squared. And then we'll simplify that. And we'll have the limit as x approaches infinity of three x squared times one over x squared. So just three plus seven times one over x squared. So seven divided by x squared divided by six x squared times one over x squared. So that's going to be six plus one times one over x squared which is just going to be one over x squared. So now we can apply our limit properties as well as our special limit and say that this is equal to three plus zero over six plus zero. And that's going to equal three sixths, which equals that one half that we came to right at the beginning by just looking at the degree of those x terms. Now, in case you weren't quite following how we went from this step to this step, just remember that our special limit says that the limit as x approaches infinity of one over x, no matter if it's one over x squared or x cubed, is going to be equal to zero, and it also doesn't matter if we multiply it by some constant. It's still going to be zero. Next, we have the limit as x approaches infinity of x squared divided by x cubed plus three. And again, if we were to use our guidelines here and look at the highest degree in the numerator and the denominator, we will see that the highest degree in the numerator is less than the denominator because two is less than three. Since that degree in the numerator is less than the denominator, we could easily see that this limit is going to be zero, but let's still go through the work to get that zero. So in this case, we're going to be multiplying by a form of one, of one over x to the largest power that we see in our function. In this case, that would be x cubed. So I'm gonna multiply by one over x cubed over one over x cubed. And this is going to be equal to the limit as x approaches infinity of one over x, right? Because this x squared is going to cancel out two of these x's, so leave us with one on the bottom. And then this is gonna be all divided by x cubed times one divided by x cubed, so just one, plus three over x cubed, because three times one over x cubed. And so then we can use our special limits, and this is going to be equal to zero, right? This is actually the purest form of that special limit, just one over x, and then one plus zero, because this is also a form of our special limit. So then this would be equal to zero over one, which is equal to zero. So just like we said right at the beginning from our guideline, this is going to be equal to zero, and then we show these steps as to why it's equal to zero. So here's a different example. Now we're going to find any horizontal asymptotes for this function. And if you watched our lesson, you know that a horizontal asymptote can be found for a function just by finding the limit as x approaches infinity or negative infinity. But I'm gonna use infinity for this example. So this actually is just another limit at infinity. So we have the limit as x approaches infinity of 4x divided by x plus five. And in this case, we could look at our coefficients of our leading x terms and see that because our x powers are the same, right? We have x to the first power on the top and the bottom, that this would just be equal to our coefficients divided by each other. We already know that this limit's going to be equal to four, but I still wanna go through the steps and show you why it's going to be four. So we'll multiply by a form of one, of one over x 
over 1 over x because our highest x term is just x, and that's going to be equal to the limit as x approaches infinity of 4, because 4x divided by x is 4, and then we have x times 1 over x, so 1, plus 5 over x, and that's going to be equal to 4 over 1 plus 0, because this is our special limit, and that's going to be equal to 4 over 1, which is 4. And so then we can say that our horizontal asymptote is at y equals 4. That would be the answer for this problem. Because when you're asked to find a horizontal asymptote, you just have to take the limit as x approaches infinity for your function. And whatever that value is, is going to be your horizontal asymptote. So this one's a little bit different because if you were to keep plugging values that get larger and larger into the sine function, you're not really going to get anywhere. Because if you recall, the graph of a sine function looks something like this, where it kind of oscillates back and forth between y equals 1 and y equals negative 1. So it never really gets close to any value as it gets larger and larger. It just goes between 1 and negative 1. And so because there's no clear direction for this, as our x values get larger, we just have to say that this one does not exist. There is just no answer for this other than that it doesn't exist because we're really not approaching anything. The function is just going to keep going from 1 to negative 1, right? It's not headed anywhere. All right, next we have the limit as x approaches infinity of the square root of 2x to the fourth power plus 8 divided by x squared minus 3. Now this one, because of that square root, it may not initially be obvious what our highest power of x is in this case, but recall that the square root of x to the fourth is equal to x squared then really these two x terms have the same power. So these would actually have the same degree. And so you could find the leading coefficients of each of the terms to find our limit. But I still wanna show all the work for this limit as well. And another result that comes out of this fact is that one over x squared is equal to the square root of one over x to the fourth, because the square root of one is just one, and the square root of x to the fourth is x squared. x squared times x squared, is x to the fourth. So we can multiply a form of one to this function that accommodates for each of those parts. So we have times the square root of one over x to the fourth over one over x squared. And that is still a form of one because this is equal to this, as we said down here. So then we can simplify and we'll have the limit as x approaches infinity of this term times this term, so just two, because two times x to the fourth divided by x to the fourth is just going to be two, so it's still under the square root though, can't forget that, and then we have plus eight over x to the fourth, and that's going to be divided by x squared times one over x squared, so one, minus three over x squared, which just comes from this three times this one over x squared. And then we can just use our special limits to finish this limit off. So we'll have that this equals the square root of two plus zero, because this is a form of our special limit, all divided by one minus zero, because this is also a form of our special limit. And so then we're going to have that this equals the square root of two over one, which equals the square root of two. And so like I said at the beginning, that since these terms have the same highest power, we could have just taken their leading coefficients, the square root of 2 and 1, and divided them to get our answer. But again, I wanted to show all of the work for this example. Then finally, we have our last example, the limit as x approaches negative infinity of negative 2x plus 3 divided by the square root of x squared plus x. And this one is a little tricky. This one's different because if you remember from the lesson, and if you didn't watch it, that's all right. I'm going to tell you right now. When you have a limit that approaches negative infinity of a rational function with a square root somewhere in it, you got to treat it a little bit differently and add an extra negative that you wouldn't otherwise. So what I mean by that is because this function has two horizontal asymptotes. If you were to graph this function, you would see that as it approaches infinity, it would have one horizontal asymptote but as it approaches negative infinity, it would have a different horizontal asymptote. And that's because that the limit as x approaches infinity or negative infinity of a function gives you horizontal asymptotes. And in this case, we're going to have to look at just the negative side rather than the positive side. Because with all those other functions, it didn't matter which side we looked at, whether we looked at positive infinity or negative infinity, because there's only one horizontal asymptote. But because functions like this are going to have two, we have to remember to treat limits at negative infinity a little bit different. So our first step is just going to be to switch this to the limit 
as x approaches negative infinity of negative 2x plus 3 over, and we're going to add another negative sign, negative square root of x squared plus x. And so now we're ready to solve this limit like we would with any other limit at infinity. So we're going to multiply by our form of 1 of our highest power, which in this case is going to be 1 over x and a square root of 1 over x squared because 1 over x is equal to the square root of 1 over x squared. So we can multiply this by 1 over x and the square root of 1 over x squared. So if we simplify this, we'll have the limit as x approaches negative infinity of negative 2 because negative 2x times 1 over x is just negative 2, plus 3 over x divided by negative square root of x squared times 1 over x squared, so 1, plus x divided by x squared, which is going to be 1 over x. And then we can use our special limits to find that this is equal to negative 2 plus 0, because this is a form of our special limit, divided by negative square root of 1 plus 0. Again, our special limit is right here. Then this is equal to negative 2 divided by negative square root of 1, which is then going to be equal to negative 2 divided by negative 1, because the square root of 1 is 1, but we still have this negative, and then we reduce this to be equal to 2. And so this was a very similar process. The only difference is that when we have this limit as x approaches negative infinity and we have a rational function with a square root in the numerator or the denominator, then we have to account for the two horizontal asymptotes and add this negative to the function. So that's all I had for these examples for limits at infinity. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comments. But that's all I had for now. So hopefully you're ready for the next lesson. But until then, I will see you next time.